Hi everyone. Uh, next packet, introduction to molecules and ions. I'll do this as a two-part thing. We'll do molecules first and ions second. So we'll do about seven pages. Okay. So first things first. Molecules, of course, all right, molecules, of course, just a few atoms stuck together. Now, if you take a biology class or maybe a biochemistry class, that can be several thousand atoms stuck together to make a molecule. But in, in general chemistry, usually, you know, up to maybe a dozen, okay? So if it's just a few atoms stuck together, it's a molecule, all right? So what is a molecule? A few atoms stuck together, right? So formally, an assembly, I'm not sure I get this correct, assembly of two or more atoms bonded or bound, this is from the book, tightly together. Remember, molecules are independent objects. Okay, it's a thing of itself, if you like. Okay, so a molecule, very simply, two or more atoms stuck together. In our course, maybe up to 12 atoms stuck together to make a molecule. But out there in the wider world, there are larger molecules. Okay, but very simply, a few atoms stuck together to make a self-contained unit. Water we saw, two H's and an O, stuck together forever to make those kind of jelly bean deals. All right. Okay, now a molecular element. So it's a few atoms stuck together of the same type, right? So remember, element matter made from atoms of the same type. So molecular element, molecule containing atoms of same type, e.g. N2, O2, Cl2, etc. Right? Those are actually examples of diatomic elements, right? Diatomic means two atoms stuck together, so diatomic molecules, diatomic elements. Molecular compound, thank our friend uh, Dalton for this. So compound, atoms in a fixed ratio, but in a smaller molecule, right? So molecule containing two or more different types of atom in fixed ratio e.g. H2O, CO2. So those are compounds, right? Different atoms in a fixed ratio. All right, now, molecules and their formulas. So it turns out we have essentially two ways to tell you what's inside the molecule. Remember my analogy? Think of a molecule like a minivan. We kind of name it based on what's inside, what the passengers are, right? So there's the molecular formula. So Nickname hydrogen peroxide, later we'll call that dihydrogen dioxide, which is its correct name, okay? But hey, the molecular formula is the actually what's inside. So if I actually drew that, that's what's inside, right? And it'll look kind of like a little, kind of little snake or something, <laughs> all right? So H2O2, two H's, two O's, has nothing to do with connectivity. Occasionally, just by random chance, it'll be the same order in here as it is in here, but oftentimes, and we'll talk about the scheme for this later, but whatever comes left on the periodic tables first, whatever's right is second in the formula, okay? So two H's, two O's, that's dihydrogen dioxide or sometimes called hydrogen peroxide, okay? That's called the molecular formula, what's actually in there, okay? Now the empirical formula is just the lowest ratio. So it turns out that all ionic formulas, we'll talk about ions more later, but all ionic formulas are empirical, it's the lowest ratio. So in a big old piece of table salt this big, there's 10 trillion trillion sodiums and 10 trillion trillion chlorides, but they're in a one-to-one -one ratio. So the formula is NaCl, right? One-to-one. -one. There's more than two ions in a chunk of table salt, right? But it's the lowest ratio. We can do that for molecules too. So the lowest ratio is one-to-one -one HO, right? So hydrogen peroxide or dihydrogen dioxide, lowest ratio, one-to-one. -one. Okay. Now, <clears throat> what we can do then, we can obviously turn what we see in nature, the molecular formula into an empirical. So let's do that first one. Hydrogen peroxide, let's call it what it really is, dihydrogen dioxide, H2O2, HO. All right, that's the lowest ratio. Try and work these out, try and work these out. So good spot to pause, turn the molecular into the empirical. Okay, you're back. 
Oftentimes we see we divide by two, often, not always, but often. So here it's n1 if you like. We don't write the one if it's a one o2. This one's very interesting, that's benzene. Okay, benzene is a super interesting molecule and uh, it has this interesting six-fold symmetry. That's why six is in there, right? Okay, so six to six, lowest ratio is one to one. Extra credit, by the end of Monday, all right, Monday of the third week, uh, whatever date that is, <laughs> okay. All right, that's actually tomorrow, right? No, it's Saturday today, so. So 13th, 14th, 15th. End of the day on the 15th, which is Monday. Tell me this, okay? So benzene is so uh, kind of famous, so to speak, that it actually has been on two stamps, postage stamps. So get me two pictures, one point per picture, the postage stamp that benzene has been on, okay? All right, butane, we can divide by two again, C2. Here we divide by six because it's supersymmetry, but here we divide by two again. And here, now, this is the real molecule, P4O10, but we always write it as it's empirical, even for balancing equations, it's just simpler that way. So P2O5, whenever we write that in the future, it's not actually P2O5 as a molecule, it's actually P4O10. Okay, so as we might mention in the notes there, empirical formulas often pertain to either molecular or covalent compounds because, you know, we can do both. This is what I'm trying to say. So you can do both for a molecule, but for an ionic, it's always the lowest ratio as standard. Okay, so NaCl, not Na5 trillion, Cl5 trillion, okay. So, so those are the two formulas, empirical and molecular. Okay, those ones you write down, but we can also visualize. We've seen pictures a little bit before. It's nice to visualize what's going on, okay? So these are called structural formulas, so it's like a map. So a structural formula is a map of where atoms are in molecules, okay? So it's another way of writing the molecular formula. But if you like with geography, Where are the atoms? Okay, so we've seen this one before. There's water, right? So there's O stuck to an H stuck to an H. We've seen that many times before. That's called a structural formula, right? So when we do the structural formula, we take the picture and we just kind of put a little bit of geography on it, okay? So that would be, you know, instead of writing H2O, we can draw a little picture. That's what the molecule kind of looks like when we do our simple picture, okay? Now, when we do this for real, Okay, and we'll do molecular models later, but in chemistry we have some kind of uh, format, right? So hydrogen is, if you do these kind of pictures here, you see them in the book. Hydrogen is always a little white sphere. Carbon to do with charcoal, which is carbon, you know, charcoal black. Nitrogen is always traditionally blue, oxygen red, think of flames, you need to burn, right? So oxygen for red. Fluorine and chlorine, kind of variations on the theme with green. Chlorine is actually green gas in real life. Sulfur, traditionally yellow, because it's a yellow solid in real life. And phosphorus, well, it's in the same group as nitrogen, so it's kind of a variation on the theme. Just bigger, it's lower down in the periodic table. Okay, so if we look here, there's CO2. So black one, carbon, red one, oxygen, right? So we can go C. Now we haven't talked about bond order yet. You can see it's kind of linear. If I put a C, O, O there just to help, right? So, you know, that's okay for now, but later on we'll figure out that that's actually two bonds between those two, that's okay. We're really thinking about who's in the middle, who's on the side. So single bond, double bond for now, later on, let's put it in the notes correctly, double bonds. Methane, we've got some three-dimensional perspective there. We can see as we get to um, molecules with five atoms or more usually, okay, we have this kind of three-dimensional shape. So oftentimes in the book you see this. Okay, that's okay. That's like a, on a flat board. That's a two-dimensional picture. Okay, but later on, maybe we'll kind of elaborate a little bit and turn it into a 3D picture. So this is okay for now. You'll see that in every single organic chemistry textbook. It's a carbon in the center surrounded by four hydrogens. But like in real life, we can have two in plane, one coming out and one going back. And we'll see that three-dimensional perspective later. It's kind of like a tripod, right? Okay, so that's later. Right? But for now, fine. Okay, so you can do the next two. Ethane or ethane and ammonia. Okay. You're back. Ethane, carbon stuck to carbon. And then three hydrogens per carbon. That's what you'll see in an organic chemistry textbook. 
Nitrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. We like to write it like that. Okay, there's actually a lone pair there. We get, when we do lower structures, that'll make more sense. But for now, yeah, that's fine. All right, so, you know, we just turn pictures into structural formulas. It kind of tells you where the atoms are relative to one another in the molecule. Okay, now, how do we name these things? Okay, I mentioned dihydrogen dioxide for H2O2 earlier instead of its nickname or trivial name. Hydrogen peroxide. How do I know that? <laughs> okay. All right. So what we're going to do now, I like to kind of teach you this like we're playing a game of Jeopardy, which is kind of fun, right? So there's Alex Trebek and there's Ken Jennings, the, you know, the grand champion recently. If you, you remember if you watched the show, he came back recently and had a tournament with all the other winners. That's when he got to a million. He got to like two and a half million or something. So he's the biggest, well, I want, he's not the biggest money earner, but he's uh, won the most games. Okay. So if you're a fan of Jeopardy, you know you kind of answer in the form of a question, all right? So let's do that, all right? So, <clears throat> formula of the material that covers two-thirds of the Earth's surface. Your answer, what is H2O, right? So there's H2O, fair enough, right? What's the name of that? Well, we say water, don't we? Because it's so common in our everyday lives, it's got a nickname, okay? But water is not what a chemist would call that. A chemist would call that dihydrogen monoxide. Oop, oxide. Oxide, that's better. Okay. Interesting, right? So water is actually dihydrogen monoxide. There was a famous, famous incident um, a few years ago now where a Michigan congressman wanted some pork barrel funding from Congress to study the alarming levels of dihydrogen monoxide in the Great Lakes. Think about that. <laughs> All right. Now, next one. Formula of the gas that's evolved through respiration, right? Hmm, you're thinking, oh, carbon dioxide. Fair enough. That's CO2. And yeah, you got the name carbon dioxide. Now the plan here is to put a few molecules down and then we'll analyze the names and the formulas and come up with a scheme to kind of create names from formulas and formulas from names. Okay. Next one. Formula of the gas that's a product of combustion under oxygen deficient conditions such as maybe a faulty water heater or a car engine sometimes. Okay. Those detectors in your bedrooms and kitchens, CO detector, right? So CO is called, you may know it, carbon monoxide. Okay, carbon dioxide, CO2, carbon monoxide, CO, if you like, one. We don't write the ones, uh, we just leave it, but um, there's a one there. So every time you don't see a subscript, it's a one. Next one, this gas, oh, I should say like Alex, right? Alex Trebek, <laughs> formula of the gas that occupies or takes up 78% of the atmosphere. Hmm, remember that one? Nitrogen gas, right? Which was N2. Now again, very common material. We're tempted to say nitrogen gas, but that's not what a chemist calls it. They call it dinitrogen. Dinitrogen. All right, now, next one. Former of the gas in the air we need for respiration, right? So we need to take in what? Oxygen gas, right? Which is the formula O2. If dinitrogen is N2, what's O2? It's dioxygen. Okay. Fair enough. All compounds, well, sorry. One, two, three compounds, two elements so far. All right. Slight difference in the naming between elements and compounds, which we'll talk about. Next one. The gas that's evolved when you strike a match, when, when you you know, you smell that kind of burnt match smell. People say, oh, that's sulfur. No, sulfur is actually on the match tip. We'll get to this equation later. The stuff you make, well, think about it. When you burn carbon, you make carbon dioxide. When we burn our charcoal, previous packet, right? When we burn carbon, we make carbon dioxide. When we burn sulfur, we make SO2. Guess what the name of that is? Sulfur dioxide. All right, fair enough. Next one. The gas, formula of the gas that was used to fill the Hindenburg. Oh, the humanity. Hydrogen, hydrogen is flammable. Helium is not. Helium is used in blimps these days, you know, Goodyear blimp, right? But back in the day, 
helium is super expensive, still expensive today, but uh, back in the day, helium was rare, so they used hydrogen, which weighs the same, right? So, uh, same effect of lift, essentially, right? But uh, super flammable, so you had to be very careful around, uh, <laughs> around the, the balloons, right? We, we've seen the Hindenburg. So, if O2 is dioxygen, N2 is dinitrogen, H2 is dihydrogen. All right. Finally, last one. Okay, see so if you can uh, name this for me just based on your intuition. It's got a nickname, cyanogen, right? Cyanogen, use that in graduate school, right? Okay, but there's two carbons, dicarbon, two nitrogens, dinitride, actually. Okay, all right. Now, there are some good examples. All right, there's some good examples. Let's talk about the rules for naming. Okay, let's talk about the rules for naming. Now, what do we notice about the order? So carbon before oxygen, hydrogen before oxygen, sulfur before oxygen, carbon before nitrogen. Well, it all comes down, and I talked about it just a little bit earlier, okay? It all comes down to where the atoms are in the periodic table, okay? So it was H2O, right? Let me try and get it on the screen here, all right? So H is here, O is here, H is left of O, so hydrogen comes first, oxygen comes second in the formula, and that's what we see. We see H first, oxygen second. Talk about numbers in a little bit, right? But hey, carbon dioxide, C and O, all right? So carbon first, oxygen second, all right? CN, C first, nitrogen second, all right, for that last one. Okay, fair enough. So that takes care of most of them, but what about this one here, SO2? Why is it SO2, not O2S? Because they're in the same column, all right? It turns out, and we'll talk more about this trend in the periodic table later, it's actually a bottom left to top right trend. Whoever's bottom left goes first, whoever's top right goes second. Normally it's a left to right thing, just look at left and right, but hey, if it's a tie, they're in the same column, so they're the same distance left and right, bottom one goes first. Okay, that's the trend in electronegativity, which we'll talk about more later. Okay, so I like to look at the periodic table, and I like um, this little region here, right? So let's just re kind of draw that map. So C and O S. All right, so formulas, atoms are written in bottom left to top right order, okay? So C comes before O, so CO2. S and O are in the same column, so bottom first, sulfur dioxide. Okay. All right, so that's the order, right? That tells you the order. You've got an H, you've got an O, H comes first in your formula. You've got an S, you've got an O, S comes first in your formula. We haven't done numbers yet, right? We haven't done names, but that's the order, right? So where they are in the periodic table tells you the order. Who's first, who's second in the formula. All right. Next one, if we look at the examples, right, we can put like C next to compound, right? What do all the compounds have in common in terms of their name that the elements, all the other ones are elements of course, elements do not. If you look at it, they all end in ide, okay? So hydrogen first, oxygen second, so hydrogen oxygen, that's the name so far if you like, right? We've just run the names of the atoms together to make a name. But then because it's a compound, hydrogen oxide, right? Or carbon oxide, right? We haven't talked about numbers again yet, but if it's a compound, it's I'd on the back, okay? So all compounds, and we're talking about molecules here, okay? All compounds have the IDE ending, okay? So carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, dihydrogen monoxide, I'd, I'd, okay? And that's a nitrogen on the back, so it's a nitride. Everything else is an oxygen, so it's oxide. Okay, complementary learning, compounds have ide, complementary learning elements do not. So if we look here, two nitrogens is just dinitrogen, right? Dioxygen. O3 would actually be trioxygen. That's ozone, but it's actually trioxygen. All right. Okay, 
So that gets us nicely onto rule number three, which will allow us in the end to name everything, right? We use a combination of prefixes, so like die, for example, or try or mono, right? And subscripts to relate how many to how many in the formula and in the name. Okay, so di means two. So dinitrogen would mean two nitrogens. Carbon monoxide, mono means one. Okay, so let's write that down. More on the next page. Prefixes, so that's your monos, dies, tries, and subscripts. That's what's actually in the formula are used to tell you, denote, right, that's to tell you, the number of each atom in the formula. Let's give you a quick heads up, right? So H2O is what? Dihydrogen. Di means two. One, if you like, monoxide. So there we go. So that's why dihydrogen monoxide is water. Okay. Now, of course, you need a list of prefixes. Some of them are obvious, some of them not, maybe not so much, okay? So, you know, one was mono, right? So, one, mono, all right? So, example, NO, you may be tempted to say mono, nitrogen, monoxide, because there's one of each. And that's good logic, right? But if we skip down here, there's some fine print, right? Because there's always a one in front, well, almost always, right? Okay, there's almost every single example, it's one with some other thing, right? So we drop mono for the first one. Don't say mono, nitrogen, monoxide. It's actually nitrogen, monoxide, right? So that is nitrogen. Monoxide. Again, drop mono for the first one if it's a single. If it's not a single, you keep it. So if it's, we do one later, P2O5, it's diphosphorus, right? Okay. Interesting story here. NO, nitrogen monoxide, is interesting because it actually renders males sterile, <laughs> right? So if you're a man and you breathe this in, it makes you sterile, which is kind of interesting. Now, when I was in Cambridge, I was working with this stuff and um, the bottle broke, right? And I kind of ran screaming from the lab. And uh, fortunately, my lab partner, my PhD student I was working with, Steph, was a girl, right? So I said, Steph, could you just go in there and just turn that off? And she did. <laughs> okay, so, and my plan's working. I now have two kids. I'm successfully polluting your gene pool, so mission accomplished. <laughs> All right, next one, die. Die, of course, means two. Now, mono means one. Think of it, monocular, right? So, like Mr. Mr. Uh, yeah, you know, it's like a single, like a telescope, a monocle, right? Or you know, a, mono, a monocular is a single telescope. A monocle is like one eyepiece, right? Monofilament. If you're into fishing, monofilament means one string, right? So, mono means one. Okay, monopod. If you're into photography, it's just a stick, right? So, mono means one. Die means two, of course, right? So. Dimer in chemistry is two atoms stuck together, all right? So, or two molecules rather stuck together. So dimer, so di means two, so that's why that one is one sulfur, so sulfur, no mono, because it's in front, sulfur di two oxide, sulfur dioxide. Fantastic, okay, so mono's one, di's two. Three, think of a three-sided shape, try, right? So you name this, what's this? PCL3. What's that? If you said phosphorus, trichloride, you are correct. Phosphorus trichloride. That's what you make when you burn phosphorus in chlorine. All right. Four now, four I've got to be careful, right? You've got to kind of think more 3D than 2D. If you think about a four-sided shape, four wheels on a vehicle quad, right? But that's not what we use, okay? If I have a four-sided shape in three dimensions, it's called a tetrahedron. So we actually use tetra. That means four, right? When I was at Bellingham in uh, Western Washington, there was actually a barbershop quartet, right? Four singers, and they're all in the chemistry department, and the name of their group was Tetramer. Nerd alert, right? <laughs> Tetramer because four molecules stuck together, barbershop quartet chemist. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so here's one. This is actually chloroform. That's its nickname. 
It's actually carbon tetrachloride. Fantastic. All right. So mono one, di two, tri three, tetra four, five. Oh, think about a five-sided shape. Think about a big building in Virginia, right? Pentagon, penta, right? Penta. If I take phosphorus and I burn it in a lot of chlorine, I get phosphorus pentachloride, right? The formula for phosphorus pentachloride. Got it? PCL3, phosphorus trichloride, PCL5, phosphorus penta. All right. And finally, six, think of a B, think of a six sided shape, hexagon, right? Hexa. Okay. This is actually a real thing SF6. That's sulfur. Can you name it? Sulfur. Hexa. Fluoride. There we go. Okay, so those are some examples with the prefixes. Again, if there's one in front, we don't use mono for the one in front, okay? But if it's two in front, we'll do one down here in a moment, we keep it. So just real quick, if we want to kind of think of that, about that before we go forward, what would N2O4 be? Well, two nitrogens, so di-nitrogen. It's a compound, so oxide on the back, but four of them, tetra oxide. So normally we don't run vowels together, so tetroxide, not tetraoxide, tetroxide. Okay. I won't take points off for spelling, but normally we drop a vowel if we have two vowels together. Okay. So here's a nice little assignment. Okay. Feel free to pause and have a go. Okay. Try and turn formulas into names, names into formulas. Okay. You're back. So let's take a look. So nitrogen and three fluoride, three fluorines. Nitrogen, tri, fluoride. Ah, here's one, Cl2O. So no mono here, because there's one in front. Two chlorine, so it's dichlorine, right? Dichlorine, and then mono, because there's an oxygen on the back, monoxide. So it's not monoxide, just drop a vowel. There you go, monoxide. Okay, here, interesting, P2O5, and we talked about that earlier, in light, real life it's actually P4O10, but here, P2O5 is diphosphorus, 5 is pentaoxide, just drop the A, pentaoxide. All right, fair enough. Move on to these guys, chlorine dioxide, one chlorine, two oxygens. It's a little bit easier to go to the names of the formulas. Chlorine pentafluoride, Cl5, F5. Dihydrogen monosulfide, dihydrogen mono, S1. Now, later on, there's different ways you can name things. Some things kind of sit on the border between molecules and ions. You can, you can name it either way. If we name this thing as an ion, which we'll do later in this packet, it's actually just called hydrogen sulfide, right? For reasons we'll talk about later, but hey, I will ask on the question, using the molecular scheme or using the ionic scheme, because there's two different ways to name things, what are these? These are all named using the molecular scheme. Okay, we're talking about molecules first. Okay, all right. Now, <clears throat> time is pretty good here, got a couple of minutes left, and we're nearly at the point where we're gonna talk about ions, okay? Now, this is super important, okay? Turns out that whether or not something is molecular or ionic depends entirely on where it is in the periodic table, okay? If they're both from what I call the top right up here, including hydrogen, it's kind of silts on the border, okay? If both atoms are from the green area, they will make a molecule for sure. If you look at every example we've done to this point, they've all been in the green area, right? However, if I make something ionic like table salt, there's Na and there's Cl, right? So they're from different areas. Bottom line is there's a line in the periodic table which separates metal from non-metal. A metal with a non-metal, a purple with a green, makes an ionic compound. We'll do those in a minute in the next few pages, right? But two greenies, two top rights, including hydrogen, make molecules. So location, location, location. If we're going into business, <laughs> right, with a fish and chip shop, 
three rules of restaurants, location, 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 same exact thing with naming things. So stop there.